Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Art as Well. And before I start uh, the conversation with, with our guests this morning, I just want to give one mention to a, a an exhibition that is currently on um, with Pamela Bree, who featured on, on The Well here before, and it's called Bridget Unfolding. And it's in the number eight gallery in Kildare Town. Uh, and it runs Tuesday to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., uh, right up to the end of February. And a lot of you will know these artists as a collective called SULT, S-U-L-T, artists, and they also have some invited guests. And the whole idea is a multimedia exhibition, uh, and it's it's dealing with the aspects of, of Bridget and traditions that would sort of surround, surround her. Um, next year, they're going to do something even bigger, because apparently the anniversary of her death um, 1,500 years ago occurs to, to in next year, 2024. And there's going to be huge celebrations um, uh, re regarding that. And that's something to look out for. Or indeed, if you're an artist and interested, you know, contact Pamela. Um, to give myself a bit of a plug, if you don't mind, uh, I've got a workshop on on the 4th and 5th of March in the United Arts Club. Uh, and it's slightly different. As you know, I do drawing, portrait drawing in particular. But this time I've asked people to come along with something um, uh, that they'd like to draw themselves. So it could be a grandparent or it could be their pet, anything. Um, and what they do is they send me the image in advance and um, I will sort of size it correctly and do various prints and prepare it so that uh, the individual can start. We're keeping it very limited. It was sold out immediately, but I've got people on a waiting list. So I'm definitely going to do another date, in which case, if you are interested, um, register your interest with me. Give us a buzz or drop me a, a line and I can put you into that. Um, so that's it. And of course, uh, oddly, and Lorcan, good morning to you before I say it, say this. How are you? Hello. You're very welcome. Good, yeah. I'm going to show you something that might ring a bell with you. All right. And it's this painting. Can you see that? Mm, vaguely. Vaguely. I'll, I'll have to pin your... Yeah. Um, oh, I'm, am I small there? Can you not see it? And now you're very large. Yeah. All right. Okay. It. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. This, this goes back to a time, the first time that I met you. Okay. I was introduced to you and um, we, 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 we did a, a workshop with you. Right. You people. And that was, you asked us to bring in uh, one or two items that, that were personal to us. Oh, so I, I brought was teaching this. you guys still life. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I brought this this old ink pot, uh, which belonged to my grandparents and, okay. and, and a copper pan. And, and we had a most enjoyable time. And I've known you since then, but I but it's been such a long time since we've, we, we've been in contact. So well, I'm delighted to meet you. That was around 2011. Was it really? Yeah. OK, long time ago. It is. So, well, so like what have you been doing in the meantime? Um, well, I sent you lots of images, so you, did. Uh, you can go through them and uh, mm. pictures uh, speak louder than words. So that's you, true. Uh, I guess, uh, in a way, paintings, if you're an artist, they're the diary of your life. Mm. So, yeah, well, we could do that. But the reason we're, we're in your house this morning is because you've got no, no Wi-Fi at all. Um, That's correct. Yeah. signal in, in your, your studio. Um, so maybe what we do first before we look at the images, Lorcan, is to go to your studio. And uh, I dropped out there early in the week and we took a, just a very quick run through um, of your studio. So I think people would like to see that. Sure. So, so just tell us where we are and okay. how yeah. big the studio is. OK, yeah. I don't know how big the studio is, actually. Yeah, well, it's sort of it's long. Yeah, it's a good 30 feet, is it? Oh, yeah, Easy. I always think a car is about oh, yeah. 10 feet. Oh, yeah, OK, no, I know 20, 15 30. feet, 15. It's actually about 45 feet. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yeah, so it's quite large. Yeah. Well, anyway, to see that. Yeah. OK, so this was once a dance studio. Was it now? All the ballerinas were at the bar here. Yeah. And the other side, there was mirrors all along the wall. Right. And... Um, it has a sprung floor, so you never get tired standing. Yeah. And... Um, As a matter of interest, whose studio was it? Um, it wasn't Joan Davis. It was. Get out of here. Yeah. You're kidding me. Yeah. She came to visit me one day. 
she, could she see her old dance studio on? She was really happy that it was now an artist studio. And I knew Jerry Davis. Yeah, of course. So yes, he yes. was really chuffed when I had this place. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, now that's really interesting because we, we did a documentary on Joan and there's a picture of her in her studio in well, Jerry and Your. Here you are. And I thought, hold on a second, there can't be too many studios yeah, that look yeah. like this. Yeah, well, this is it. That's extraordinary. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I've been here quite some time, many years, as you know, and. Um, yeah, I kind of have it laid out where that's my resting area where I, um, you were where people guests. came <laughs> or whatever. And up here is great because most of the light um, is perfect here. Yeah. And, um, it's easy to work in really large canvases. I have a couple of easels, as you see, so mm. some of them for large canvases, other for ordinary size. And I have a storage area there at the back with a lot of ventilation behind it. Um, and what else can I say? Um, that's my old friend Patrick Pye. Has it, yes. Yeah, he passed away a few years ago. I made that painting up in his studio, up in Piperstown. Did you? Yeah, he said if I had to paint him, I had to come up to Piperstown. So, um, yeah, I missed him after he left. He was a soul so on the same wavelength as myself. And, um, yeah, so... That's really it. Um, so your your all your paints and brushes are kept here, yeah. I tend to keep stuff. I'm tidy and untidy. At the moment, it's relatively tidy. When I'm working really well, the place turns into an absolute mess. And then, when I feel my life's falling apart, I tidy it up, yeah. and then feel very secure again. And that's. That's the way. I'm as neurotic as any other artist, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so all all artists are neurotic, are they? Um, well, you don't want to go into the psychology of creativity. It is a neurosis, yeah. Indeed, indeed. All right, um, Lorcan. I think we will, as, as you suggested yourself, um, we we we'll start to look at some of your images. Sure. And uh, you can you can talk us through that. Uh, and that that will probably give us a good flavor of of you. Uh, that's better. Yeah. OK, Lorcan, off you go. OK, well, um, <clears throat> this image, it's uh, a portrait of a friend's daughter. Um, I guess I put this image first because my work is based on drawing. I was very fortunate. As you know, I'm from Mullingar, and uh, years ago, I think about 1971, um, I met another Mullingar artist. He was nine years older than me. I think he was 28. And that was Patrick Graham, or Paddy Graham. Mm -hmm. And he had a big show in the Hugh Lane last year. He was a friend of my father's and um, he was very encouraging to me. And um, so he was really the first artist that I knew. And he was uh, of the opinion that art is completely dependent on drawing if you want to be a painter. And he was an amazing and is an amazing draftsman. So uh when I as I went through college, I the emphasis for me was to learn how to draw, to teach myself how to draw. And um along the way I came across the Nicolades method, which is a brilliant way of drawing. And um yeah, so I I I like to 
think in terms of three dimensions. Um, mm. I, I try to draw like I'd imagine a sculptor would draw more than a painter. So um, the other reason why I put up that head is my go-to place as an artist is portraiture. Um, when I was a child, I used to try and draw chill or people all the time. Mm. And um, I guess that was my main interest. I thought if I could ever draw a person and paint a person, I'd be made. But um, anyway, yeah, that's the first image. I think the next one is a, yeah, it's a, an actual portrait. I forget when I made this, probably about fifteen or twenty years ago. Um, I love to have people in the studios and sit for a portrait. I love to have friends sit uh, and. Um, it takes me forever to make a portrait because um, I often wipe out the painting even after maybe 10 sittings. I say, I'm sorry, I'll start again um, because I'm not really, I'm on one level, I'm after a likeness of the person, but on um, a deeper level, what I'm really trying to get to is the person's presence, what it feels like to be them, what's going on inside them, really. And um, I particularly liked this portrait because there was a tension in the sitter. And um, I, I guess the portrait, it almost feels his breath, his breathing. And um, so, I also like the challenge of uh, profile, mm. which is um, it's kind of difficult to paint a profile of a person convincingly. Uh, I think you have to think like a sculpture. You have to think in low relief. And, yeah. yeah. And, and Lorcan, would you do preliminary drawings before doing a painting like that? Not at this stage of my life, no. Oh, OK. Um, uh, anyway, the sitter always keeps changing. Um, mm. Like no one sits the same way twice. So mm. I have a way of painting that can move with the sitter. Um, well, that just comes with time and practice. Yes. And I actually don't like to pin myself down at all. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, the, next, the, the next one is, is probably a very good example of what I you've just said. Put it in because um, I, I've never made a painting like this before or since. Um, I decided to paint two portraits of the person on the same canvas. And um, it was kind of awkward uh, to do. Um, I don't know why it was difficult. There was a few reasons, but um, I did it over a long period of time and it's unfinished, but I like the unfinishedness. Uh, my sister got fed up sitting and um, I kept <laughs> resigned to the she? background. <laughs> and, uh, but what I liked about it was um, that person was at different stages of their life uh, because it took so long because she was sitting over maybe a year and or a year and a half, maybe she came in at different times. And um, so I was able to, or different, uh, different senses of who she was uh, arrived. So, um, yeah. So do you, do you talk to the sitter quite a lot to get that sometimes, sense of person? Yeah, I'd be trying to be really organized and quiet and we'd both be very, still and you'd work and then other times unfortunately a conversation would start and wreck the whole thing uh, but that's good that's a part of it because yeah. what when i'm painting i'm i'm just thinking in technical terms i'm just thinking of how the light is how the structure is how the color paint all that stuff yeah. but internally uh, I, th I think we pick up an enormous amount of stuff through our senses. And um, 
I, I, I suspect we know more about someone in the first few seconds that we meet them than we'd uh, than we realize. Yes. And I, I, I guess when someone's sitting for you, you can even see after maybe the third sitting that they start to relax more and they sit in their natural posture. And while that's going on, I think uh, the, the, the energy they're transmitting changes and you pick that up. And I guess that's what a portrait is. It's a, a discussion between the inner life of the artist and the inner life of the sitter. Yes. So uh, I think that's all part of the process. Mm. And it's really interesting. Yeah. It is, it is very interesting. And, and I remember when we were doing portraits uh, with you or painting, um, when I thought I was at a very advanced stage and everything was looking reasonably okay, you said, okay, now everyone kill your babies, wipe everything out and start again. Yeah, and I suppose that's the same thing about the sitter was relaxing more so, changing uh, position, and then you have to interpret that. Yeah, well, the yeah, I, I why I suggest people do that is uh, people get the it's too easy to get very precious to think what you're doing is. Um, that it's really getting there. Um, how would I put it? Yeah, yeah it, the whole trick of painting is to be always at the beginning, to be always trying to see something for the first time. Mm. And if you lose that, all you're going to do is you're going to transfer all of your previous experiences mm onto what you see. And so you stop seeing and yeah. start thinking about what you see. It's, I, I, it's uh, yeah. kind of sophisticated thing. Kim and Nicolade's book, The Natural Way to Draw, he, all his exercises exist to defeat that yeah. way of being. But anyway, that's for- uh, Yeah, no, it's a very, very interesting, very, very interesting, yeah. Hours of <laughs> discussion. <laughs> okay. Oh, here's, um, yeah. Uh, this is a piece I made between 1986 and um, 1994. I was um, very concerned in the 1980s about nuclear war. Uh, there was a, a very serious arms race then, and at one stage, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States were it had ceased communication with each other, very like last year, like what happened in the Ukraine. And um, I've always been aware of nuclear weapons because way back in the early 60s, um, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I can remember we were going to school one morning and we were 10 or 11 years of age and um, one of the uh, teachers, uh, it was Christian brothers, we were going to God help us, but one of them announced that the world may end that day and we have to start praying. And um, I can remember going home and I picked up my parents' fear and I asked them what was going on. And, was the world going to end? And uh, after that experience, I guess I became very aware of um, how fragile really our existence is. And mm -hmm. I, I read up a lot about um, the Manhattan Project and uh, all of that stuff as a teenager. And um, yeah, so I, I made a series based on uh, nuclear war, and this was a study for a large painting that I made, and it's called Enola Gay, and Enola Gay was the name of an aeroplane that dropped 
the, uh, the bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. Mm -hmm. uh, the name of the bomb was called uh, Little Boy, and the name of the plane, it was named after the pilot's mother. And I, I thought Enola Gay is quite a beautiful name and for such a terrible event. And the idea of human vulnerability and the nude, um, the figure, um, I, I tried to put all of those together mm. and um, then to use the idea of the actual flash when the a nuclear bomb detonates and so um yeah they you uh, actually you actually created that didn't you i mean this is not yeah, just I, um, I made a box and mm. it's a makeshift uh thing i in the kitchen of uh of the house where i lived and um i'd i'd noticed the shadows there used to be bars on the window and i noticed how the shadows worked and um, yeah. So I, I kind of created that and had um, my model, God help her, adopt various poses. And that was the one that kind of worked most. I don't usually work from photographs, but in this case, I made a photograph because just of all of the, the light stuff and and the bars. At that time, there wasn't digital photography like there is now, but I was very fortunate that I uh, had quite a good camera and I put it at a very long exposure and, yeah, got an image that I could work from. It's uh, Conte and charcoal on paper, yeah. But And, and you, did, you did a large painting subsequent to that? Yeah, but I was never really happy with the painting. Um, uh, I kept working with that image and I arrived at that eight years later. Mm. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm very slow uh, as in my creative process. Uh, it takes me forever to arrive at what I'm happy with. And um, yeah, but I, I make an awful lot of work at the same time. Sometimes I can have up to 40 pieces, maybe 50 even, yes. in various stages. And um, yeah. I just keep working through them. And then every so often, one, I come into the studio and I realize, oh, finally, that's where that has, that's talking back to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is from a catalogue, the page of a catalogue, it's a scan, so there's better images in a minute. It's yeah. a very long drawing, it's, um, I think it's six, or five, or eleven, and four, and four, and five. so it's twelve, it's nearly a sixteen uh, feet when it's all combined. Is it? Yeah. Mm. So it's quite long, uh, and I, it's called Opus Day, which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Latin means the work of God. And uh, I began it after the Warrington bombing and uh, where two children were blown up in England by an IRA bomb. And it isn't a really a political piece. It's um, I guess I was trying to understand or not understand, address that shadow part that's in the human condition that can bring people to a place where they can be so callous and so detached from their own humanity to murder like that. And um, so it's designed in a way that it reads from left to right. So it's one large movement. Mm -hmm. And what I used were images that already existed. Uh, I didn't want to use any of my own imagery. I, 
I wanted to go back into the history of art to have a look at it. Yeah, this is the first image. It's the left hand side. So uh, what I wanted first was the idea of the human unconscious. So the image is underground and um, in the center is a pool. And I guess the pool is uh, in Jungian terms, it would be the collective unconscious. From Freud's point of view, it would be the age. It would be where our instinctual uh, images and drives reside. So on the back is the, probably most painters looking at this will recognize Masakio's expulsion from the garden. And I put it as though it was on a cinema screen, because in the 20th century, that's how we tend to present the images to ourselves. Uh, I made this in 1994, so I could never have imagined how people would be totally stuck to screens now. But anyway, I used the image of a movie screen with Masakio's expulsion. Um, Masakio's mm -hmm. expulsion was, I think, painted in 1420, around that. In, it's in a church in Florence. I've seen it. It's amazing. And anyway, so that's the, that image of the expulsion. It's in the Western mm -hmm. mind, the idea that we've um, lost some paradise that uh, would we're, we're in this, as the Christians called it, the Valley of Tears. That, uh, that's, that's huge in the Western psyche, that someplace in the past we, we were much happier than we are now. But I, mm. I doubt if that is true. But um, anyway, the, the first image is the angel, and it comes from the Annunciation, which is... Uh, the Da Vinci Annunciation, which is also in Florence in the Uffizi. So I took uh, or borrowed or stole um, Da Vinci's amazing angel from the Annunciation. And uh, he or she or is our angel is non-binary, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the Annunciation in the original painting is telling the virgin well you're uh, you're going to have a child of god but here the image in the pool is um w eugene smith's um amazing photograph of a mother and a child uh, from Japan in the 70s who the, the children had got mercury poisoning from uh, an industrial uh, complex. And um, I found that image was uh, very useful and very powerful in this instance because it was very much like uh, Michelangelo's Pieta which is one of the most extraordinary pieces of sculpture imaginable. And um, so there was the, the same sorrow. Uh, and so the angel now is uh, announcing the sorrow rather than uh, the joy. Mm. And the dove above, which is flying obviously through this labyrinth of underground tunnels uh, I borrowed from a uh, Raphael drawing. Uh, I wanted to put Raphael in there some uh, someplace because the final image on the other side is his. So you can go to the next image if you'd like. Yeah, so uh, this is the central image. Um, a friend had given me this book of photographs from um, that festival that happens down in uh, southern Spain 
every Easter, I think, where um, they celebrate their Christianity and also lots of other things like the Spanish Inquisition and all the darkness that seems to be in the Spanish psyche gets out for a walk um, mm. at that particular occasion. And yeah. <clears throat> in one of the photographs, there were these two images, the, or this image of a child and probably his father, all dressed up, Ku Klux Klan-like, and they were in a crowd, but I um, isolated the image. Um, and I think it kind of speaks for itself. It's the Jesuit idea, give me the child and I'll give you the man. And um, I've, I've always been very wary of religion since I, I was a child. And I always sense the power of it. And as I got to know the history of it, I, I don't think I really like religion at all. Um, I I like um, what was a Seneca, you know, what he observed uh, two thousand years ago. Uh, what was it? Um, the many say it's true, the wise say it's false, and the rulers know that it's useful. And so I tend to see it that way. And yeah. yeah so um, what's the significance of of the the uh, piece underneath? Um, well, at that time, I was teaching uh, life drawing when I made this, and um, I can remember we were working from the skeleton, and I wanted to balance off this image and give it an ecclesiastical feel, so I used gold leaf and um, the... At that time, one of uh, my, uh, in my record collection, I used to have big, you probably remember them. Well, it came back vinyl, but mm -hmm. there was a uh, U2's Joshua Tree had this amazing uh, spread of photographs of the guys taken out in the desert. So I decided to have my own you two uh, skeletons uh, underneath. Um, sometimes I just do things out of, uh, just to amuse myself. So that's how <laughs> that came about. Okay. But it's the idea of death also, yeah. Yes. And this is the other side of the triptych. And um, it's from a Raphael drawing of 1501, The Massacre of the Innocents. And I always thought of this uh, drawing as a, a ballet. He made a small print and in the print, the drawing isn't finished. It's a pen and ink drawing his, but um, I fell in love with the drawing so much that I wanted to see how it would work on a larger scale. And, I did a lot of research on it to see if he actually ever made a painting of it. He didn't. Some other artists copied it and made uh, prints, but um, that's back in kind of the 1500s. Mm -hmm. um, the reason this drawing was the reason why I made the entire piece because um, the week that the Warrington bomb went off, I was teaching movement in art. I, I used to be a life drawing instructor and um, I, was, I was working for an animation company that was in Ireland at that stage. And I used to do workshops so there, the animators, their drawings would stay alive, but uh, the workshops were actually, it was very structured life drawing. So um, I, I reckoned that the movement and the use of line and space and everything in this was a good point to start. But as I said, the bomb went off the week I was given that class. And um, I just thought how extraordinary this is still going on. And 
was going on in 1501 and it's been going on and on and on. And I made this piece first. This was the first piece of the triptych I made. And it was in my studio when this English art collector um, was over. Uh, he was um, over for a completely different reason in Ireland and to collect art. But by just a weird coincidence, he ended up in my studio and asked what this was about. And I explained that I'd uh, made it because of the Warrington bombing. That I, and he said, are you going to show it there? And I didn't know if Warrington was a town or a village or it happens to be kind of a small city, really, the size of Galway. Mm -hmm. And he said um, he knew the director of the museum there. There was a museum with a big art space in it. And uh, so I ended up having a show there a, a year later. So this piece mm -hmm. went to a few countries as a result of that. And um, yeah. yeah. Very good. It's it's very. very good. I think the the one before it, the Nola Gay one, last yeah. last year we all got a bit of a shock, where we suddenly saw the the shadow again. Anyway, Indeed, fast yeah. forward into the future. Um, well, this photograph is by a wonderful Mullingar photographer. Uh, Mullingar seems to produce uh, creative people every so often, and. His name is Marish Moynihan, and he's a lifelong friend of mine and uh, photographs most of my work, which is super. Mm -hmm. But um, to explain this photograph, I have to say that in the 70s, I was in the National College of Art. Um, I was in Sligo first in the art school there. and then I ended up in the College of Art and at that time the College of Art half the staff in the painting department or more were English and um, I can remember wishing that the Irish had a tradition of painting like the English and the French and the Italians or, but we didn't seem to, we seemed to be working from other people's traditions. And one day, one of the tutors said to me, well, actually, the Irish are an illiterate, uh, a visually illiterate race. And I, I can remember being disturbed by that remark. And I had a book on Celtic art in the house where I was living. And so I started to go to the National Museum and look at artifacts there. And uh, I started to see that there was a, that Ireland, pre-colonial Ireland was far from uh, visually illiterate, mm. but it was um, in ma mainly metal objects and uh, I guess uh, books like the Book of Kells, mm, yes, I've known since a childhood, which always uh, kind of did something to me. But um, I, I can remember at that time I, I was just too young to be too young a painter to be able to really connect with all those artifacts, and. Um, Years later, uh, maybe 20 years, it was 1997, I started to go into the National Museum every year for three months and they let me bring in an easel and uh, let me store a big drawing board and I started to make drawings of uh, just at random of all the artifacts that caught my attention. So I was making drawings of artifacts from three and a half thousand BC to say the 13th century and gradually I started to focus in on three objects in the uh, era that would span from the 8th 
to the 12th, 13th century. And it was where the, it was the Middle Ages and some of them were the kind of church treasures of the Middle Ages. And these drawings uh, were of croziers and of um, bells and shrines. So mm -hmm. these, I tended to work from the drawings. I brought the drawings to my studio and then I would um, develop them into paintings. And this sesh is three studies towards a large painting. Then you see the large painting. Yes. I always, when I'm working large, I tend to make small studies first, just mm -hmm. to figure out where I'm at and then move into the larger painting. So this is, yeah, that much better shot of that. And um, so the, Big so, challenge, really. Talking, you, 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 came, you came up with, with a, an entire sort of catalogue, didn't you, almost? Of, of... Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I made about 100 drawings. I destroyed yeah. half of them because I wasn't happy with them, but I got about 50 drawings that uh, I knew I could yeah. live with. And then actual paintings, how many did you? I don't know. That's serious. Um, I, I think there were about 40, were there? Show in the National Museum, there was 69 pieces. Oh, there you are, yeah. was too much, really. But um, the big challenge, as you see in this uh, painting, is to get the sense of the energies that I... I encountered in those pieces from the past, mm. which were metal pieces, but to translate that into, I, I guess my paintings belong to, I'm, I'm a, a modernist, so I, I, my paintings come out of what happened between 1870 and 1960 I, I guess that's really the kind of way I think about painting yeah. so I, I had to develop I guess my it's my visual language meeting uh, a pre-colonial visual language and mm. trying to bring that into the present yes. so yeah these are the bells these are some of the drawings that's they, I, I like the bells because they had a, a torso kind of like presence for me. So there's two of them together. They're about three foot by three foot each. Yeah. And um, and do you, you exhibit these it's in the Limerick? As well to a painter called Charlie Brady, who was one of my tutors and one of the great, uh, he was American, but I think one of the most important painters in Ireland of the last century. And mm -hmm. I, I got from him, I got a sense of how to isolate an image, how to make a very simple image, uh, quite subtle. So you'll notice with these two images, for instance, that the uh, horizon line, it doesn't, it, one side is higher than the other. Yes. If you look at a Cezanne still life, you'll find that he developed that kind of a trick. But uh, in the way that the, say that the Raphael drawing that your eye moved through it, uh, in the same way, I tried to make your eye move around very simple paintings. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, um, and I, I like the paintings to be sculpture. Mm. Yes, very sculptural, yeah. Okay, this is a missile mm. box. Um, mm. They were beautiful small boxes that um, were used to hold um, missiles, uh, Bibles. So the book yeah. of Hells at one stage may have, may have been in this and they were passed among the powerful families mm. and over centuries, different jewels were added to the boxes. This one is the, I think it's, um, I forget the name, but it's not the Shrine of the Mishok. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 
this, these are paintings that I've made from the missile boxes. And so the missile boxes are tiny. I've blown these up. And um, the photograph was taken by my friend Murish again years later. So the first Same photograph pose. I was a young man of 53. So I'm um, uh, a more mature man of 70 in this. So uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you've you've changed it quite a bit, haven't you? From I, I, was. behind, you'll notice that there's a, a figurine, a female figure, and um, so I took out the crucifixion image in them, uh, simply because well, I repainted that piece this year. Mm -hmm. um, I realised that people had a huge problem with any of these pieces when I'd use uh, an original crucifixion image mm. that was in the, and as soon as I changed it to a female image, the response was completely different. And um, I guess uh, the Irish, like we got over colonization when we got rid of the British, but then we got recolonized by De Valera and McQuaid by nationalism and by religion. We had our own Taliban in a way. And I think now we're only coming to terms with it. And in the same way as, say, the Taliban or in Iran, their religions repress women. In Ireland, women were horrendously repressed in the first years of our so-called free state. And um, I, I showed this piece recently in the Hunt Museum in Limerick, and I was amazed at how, when at the opening I explained how I changed this, how the women at the opening and the women that came to the show really responded to this. So mm -hmm. it got me thinking, and uh, last Sunday I had uh, Ned Kelly, that's Edward Kelly, this is forms on them. He's uh, the specialist in bog bodies, and he's been my main advisor in this whole project. But he's written loads of papers about the female presence in pre-colonial Ireland and all the Ashling poems. So now I'm going to just bring this artifacts project a bit further. And mm -hmm. He's after sending me loads of papers that I have to devour, but he's going to um, advise me on how I can seek out all the female references I need for the next bit of the show. Anyway, yes. Yes. that's um, yeah. a long project. OK, this is from after 2013, my mother died. And after she died, I made or a lot of very strange <clears throat> images arrived. I just went along with them. This piece, uh, I started it, I think it was the week she died, and this image arrived very, very quickly. And um, so I guess, in a way, I, I use art to really, I, I don't make pieces for over people's mantelpieces or whatever, uh, or. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I never think in terms of an audience. I guess I just put or go after what I, I need to see. And mm. the, all these, uh, this is uh, another one from that whole series of images that arrived after she she died. And um, I still don't understand them, but I, I like them. They're gesso and uh, pencils. Uh, I was just about to ask you that. Watercolor yeah. pencils, and um, I have a kind of a way of working with them. They're quite large, those pieces. They're on uh, beautiful um, Italian paper. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is just something else. You were asking me, what have I been doing since? Mm. Uh, well, since 19... 94, I've been working on a novel that's illustrated and it's nearly finished. I, mm -hmm. I'm just adjusting the last chapter and these are 
two uh, illustrations from that. It's very dark. It's a novel that um, focuses on the shadow side of the, the human condition. So yes. um, anyway, I hope I get it published now in the next year or two. I have two books written that I now that are just coming to completion. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. OK, so this is the I think there's only two more images after this. there are. Yes, that's all. Yeah. And the last uh, 10 years, I have also been working on a whole set of heads that just uh, come from my imagination. And I, I began them one day just after someone had sat and I thought to myself, I wonder how much I collect unconsciously, how much have I inside from all of these different sitters. And I started this just to as an experiment to see what could come out. And I was very interested in the idea of masks. I always have been. Mm. And um, this is, yeah, this is another of the series. Well, this one's kind of a joke in a way, um, though serious. Um, I've always been amused by um, official portraits, especially where you get someone who get their chain of office and the gown the graduated in and um, surround themselves with little objects that show their status. Uh, it's a tradition that goes right through the history of art, but uh, I, I find that it's, uh, it gets particularly, particularly uh, peculiar um, in the 20th century. So I decided to make my own version of it. So all the painters looking on may recognize this figure, uh, the lower part of it, uh, echoes Rembrandt's self-portrait at 63. Mm -hmm. The central part I, I liked, it's in New York, uh, in the Met, I spent uh, I went twice, two days, just looking at the Rockefeller collection of African masks, which just, I couldn't believe that someone had collected so many, but also the power that's in them, the primitive thing. Mm -hmm. And as you probably know, the African mask changed the whole history of European painting uh, in when people like Picasso came across all these masks that uh, were being imported into Paris. Uh, the African mask and the Italian print or the Japanese print changed European painting. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a private joke, uh, but I've been working on, after I made this, I started to work using a lot of imagery from African mm -hmm. Yes. sculpture and masks okay so the next piece which is the last piece is from a piece of sculpture in Benin but now it doesn't really resemble much the actual original piece and I call this piece shaman because I love the idea of a shaman that someone who has such a dark internal life that they can obviously see your life as well um mm. it's a kind of a spirit force and um the fish image came from something someone said to me years ago a man who was slowly going mad well had told me that there was a, a black fish swimming around inside his mind and uh yeah so yeah uh, that piece arrived this year it's the most one, one of the recent pieces. So that's yes. your little tour through my last few years. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of people who've made comments. I'm going to go through them. I haven't looked at them yet. So um, what was the drawing style you found? 
I think it was, did you say Nicolades or something? It's this it's book called The Natural Way to Draw by him and Nicolades. Nicolades was a teacher in the Art Students League in yes. uh, the 40s and 50s in America. Nisha to everyone. I think it was Patrick Pye that was the portrait in the wall in the studio. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I'm his daughter. That's right. That's right, <laughs> Nisha. Know. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Nisha. That's great. And it was lovely to hear Dad's name mentioned. He always spoke well of you, Lorcan. Sorry my connection isn't great, so I'll have to watch this on YouTube. Um, we should also give a shout out to your daughter. Okay. Karina, okay. whose birthday is today. Yeah. She's, she's watching, I think, as well. So happy birthday to you. Um, Tim Gooling, <clears throat> like you, Lorcan, I'm incredibly conscious of the possibility of nuclear annihilation and the way this is conveniently ignored. Wonderful portrait of the great Patrick Pye. That's from Tim Goulding. Uh, Nicholas says, Remind, it reminds me of Durer, the three long sketches. Yeah. Tim Goulding, concerning religions, identification leads to division. Beliefs are brutal things. Yeah, I can tell you, you, you have a lot in common with uh, Lorcan. Uh, I love Lorcan's original dusky color sense. And Irene says, Having taught part-time at primary level for years, art is thrown out to the edges of the curriculum. There's no respect for it. The Dark Ages were here produced incredible work, but somewhere along the way, it became a poor relation of the various art disciplines. Would you concur, Lorcan? Um, yeah, to some degree. <laughs> yeah, okay. Catherine Green says, Lorcan, I've admired your work for a very long time. I love that you give drawing its due weight and honour. Here, here, says I. Um, your portraits are inclusive and moving. Thank you for making the world richer. Thanks mm. for that, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, Stephanie McLaughlin says, totally agree with Lorcan's view of female repression by church. Very strong symbolism in having the female figure in the work. Thank you. Wilma, love your work. They remind me of Hodler, a Swiss symbolic painting from the 19th century. Uh, you probably love his work. Uh, Robert, whoever, great talk. Many thanks. Got to go. All right. Cheers. Bye, Robert. Um, Wilma, do you go to the Biennale this year in Venice? Many beautiful oh. masks and their influence on art to be seen. Okay. Oh, uh, Owen McLaughlin, amazing, thought-provoking interview. Thank you. Catherine Gagan, love the paintings done after your mother died. How long after her death were you able to paint them? Immediately. And, and did that continue for long, I think? It was... Oh, um, yeah, about two years. But I, I think that, like, it, the grief process um, is, the, initially it's two years, and then it's four years uh, from start to finish. So um, I, I realized this was connected to that, like, mm. um, I, I don't know how much you know about the grief process, but it's kind of, it, it's a set of stages you go through. Okay, all right. Um, Tim also says, really in awe of the depth of Lorcan's perception of the human psyche and its expression in art. David Goldberg looks like the Olmec Hedas of South Mexico. Those weigh in at 100 tons. Heads. Sorry, heads. Not Hedas. <laughs> um, have to leave. All right, take care. Elizabeth says, lovely talk. Thanks, Lorcan and Alan. Eilish, wonderful episode. Many thanks. And Irene says, I love your work. There's a quiet beauty in all of it. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Or Owen. Um, Lorcan, um, congratulations. The work is very impressive. It's lovely. Thank and you. I love the piece you have in, in uh, Lewin. Uh, and, oh, in Athlone um, at the moment. Yes, yeah, yeah in Athlone, yes. Yeah, very nice. I might see you there on Wednesday if you're collecting your work. Okay. But uh, there you go. Anyway, it's good to see you, and uh, I, I love the work. Well, Owen is another Malangar man. That's right. ah, <laughs> there right. are so many. They're all here. <laughs> anyway, it's great stuff. Great. Really. Thanks. So. Thanks. Uh, well, there's one thing before we go. Yeah. Um, and that is, I did promise people that you did have another side to you, another gift that uh, I, I reckoned none of your um, people that would know you, maybe your family, of course they'd know, but certainly not, not, not most of us. 
And, and that is something that happened to you when you were 11 years of age at home. You had a particular interest and somebody called to see your mother. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was telling you about Will that. you tell us briefly about that? OK. Um, when I was a kid, I, yeah, I learned to play chess. I just um, fell in love with the game and good at chess, bad at life. So anyway, um, my, uh, we had a shop at home and this man came. He used to make uh, family crests of arms. Mm. And um, he was a foreign, he was Hungarian. And uh, I think my mother must have fancied him because he was a very <laughs> handsome man. But um, anyway, she asked him, what did he do? Because uh, before he left Hungary, in 1956, there was the Hungarian uprising and he, he had escaped. A lot of uh, people had to flee and he moved to Ireland. And she, he told her he was a chess grandmaster. So when she told him that she had this kid uh, who was mad about chess. So I was very fortunate that um, he used to um, come every so often to the house and he'd very politely shake hands with me. I was just a kid and we'd sit down and then he'd annihilate me on the chessboard. But it was uh, my first encounter with real genius and um, I've, I've been addicted to chess ever since and it's the way I keep myself sane um, yeah. and with the internet it's extraordinary you can play people all over the world so that's my yeah. last remaining addiction and, and, and I, I, be I believe there are there are evenings where you might play eight games with uh, yeah, five minute the timelines. Blitz chess, where yeah. you play 40 moves in five minutes. And uh, if anyone uh, got hooked on that recent um, TV series, um, what was it called? The Queen's Gambit, which was based on the Bobby Fischer Spassky game in Reykjavik. Um, mm. They, they'd, they'd know what it's like to be obsessed with chess. Mm. It's um, chess and painting have an awful lot in common, but it should take an hour to explain all that. Yeah. I wonder, are there any other artists out there that have the same obsession? Because I was I'm quite sure taken when are. you said that. Yeah. Because you said it takes a certain type of person to, to be really, you know, able to. It's not uh, it's, it's it's if it, people think of chess as uh, uh, mathematical. It's not. I was absolutely useless at maths in school. It's uh, chess is actually once you learn all the openings and stuff, uh, you learn them through osmosis. But it's a visualizing thing. So hmm. it's seeing patterns and um, if like a brilliant chess player grandmaster would see a pattern maybe 10 or 15 moves ahead he'd mm. actually see the solution and then his job is just to think backwards to make sure that it's the correct one it's um mm, interesting yeah, it's it's just it's it's the right side of the brain is more important in chess than the left side the left side is sequential the right side sees the bigger picture mm -hmm. uh, in painting I mean all the Nicolades drawing exercises are to uh, activate the right side of the brain uh, right. and uh, free you from the sequential right. left side so yeah. that's very similar actually yeah, yeah. very yeah. interesting very interesting yeah. okay so look unless anyone else has any comment to make um uh, Carol says, I play chess too. I usually play very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I was also hopeless at maths. Thank yeah. you for a great and nourishing and inspiring uh, hour, Lorcan. All right. Carol, All thanks right. for that. Listen, thanks for uh, everybody for, for looking in. Uh, Lorcan, again, thank you. Thank um, you. Next time, right. we're actually going to New York. How fancy is that? 
uh, uh, to, to visit an Irish artist. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I won't be going there, <laughs> but by the miracle of modern technology, uh, we'll be hooking up um, with somebody who shall remain nameless uh, until nearer the time. And I think you'll enjoy that. OK, so again, thanks all for watching. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, long weekend. Um, and if you get a chance to see Bridget unfolding down in Kildare, uh, go down there and, and feast your eyes and in the number eight gallery. OK, take care, everyone. Bye bye.